This is Epicenter, episode 397, with guest Dankhard Feist. Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with... Brian Crane. And today we're speaking with Dankrat Feist, who is a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation and heads the effort into sharding and statelessness updates for Ethereum 2. But before we talk about um, Ethereum 2 with Dankrat, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors for this week. Paraswap just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap and comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. Start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. And also by Exodus. Exodus is an easy-to-use wallet which supports lots of assets and has native apps for all the platforms, including iOS and Android. It's a fully non-custodial wallet. They believe in not your keys, not your coins. And so, yeah, go to exodus.com and give it a try. And with that, yeah, let's, let's hand over to Dunkrat. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Maybe you can start before we dive into all of the technical topics. Do you mind introducing yourself a little bit and telling us sort of how your journey has come to working on Ethereum? Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, my my journey to Ethereum um, is uh, yeah a bit different from probably most people because I came to it uh, uh, quite late, I'd say. So I only started... Uh, fully working um, in Ethereum research uh, around uh, 2019. And uh, bef before that, I worked for all different uh, tech companies. I, I had a startup um, and um, I was basically recruited into the Ethereum research team after I had uh, solved some research problems earlier for them and uh, worked on them. And um, yeah, so basically since um, early 2019, I'm uh, working for the Ethereum research team. It has been like a very fun journey and, uh, and yeah, I'm really enjoying uh, doing research on the future of Ethereum. Cool. So we had an episode on Ethereum 2 recently with Danny Ryan, and uh, we actually ended up talking um, about the merge and the switch to proof of stake for the entire episode. But there's a couple of more Uh, more updates that are coming with Ethereum 2. So can you give us a very brief overview over the potential protocol updates and where they're at right now before we deep dive into them? Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there there, there will be um, several more updates. I think like the, the really the biggest one that everyone is uh, waiting for is the, the big promised upgrade um, of sharding. Um, and so probably like um, a while after the merge, I don't know, I would estimate between six and 12 months, we will activate um, data shards, which um, essentially means we are adding this uh, very large data availability layer to Ethereum, um, which means that you might have heard of uh, rollups, um, which are basically a system where you only post transaction data to the chain and you don't actually execute them. So you either use fraud proofs or zero knowledge proofs in order to ensure that um, all this is actually valid. And, um, and the data shards actually allow us to, instead of posting that data on the um, current uh, very limited ETH1 chain that will be merged into the beacon chain uh, with the merge, um, instead of posting it on there, you can uh, post it to um, to these data shards and ensure like it's available and everyone can very easily verify that it's available. But it will be much, much cheaper because you have so much more space available there. This Further to this, um, there will be a lot of work on on the security um, of this. So we will we we have kind of opted for this gradual rollout where we don't like um, uh, do everything in one big bang, which um, kind of started with actually started last December with launching the beacon chain and will continue with the merge and then a rollout of sharding. And there will basically, um, after that, there will be many further um, upgrades, which are probably a bit less obviously visible to the user because they're more security upgrades. So we kind of opt for this um, way of rolling out features first. We start by like making the, the big, rolling out the big features and then 
we add um, everything that is required uh, to get them to the, towards the highest security. Um, so they will basically be um, all the work around ensuring data availability. Um, that's uh, the, the proof of custody and uh, data availability checks, which are basically um, further upgrades that are required uh, to make it uh, to make data availability basically um, fully incentive comp compatible, like um, to make sure that there are no um, incentive problems for validators. Before we go into, I, I think there's like so much already, I think that we should probably explore a bit more. So you mentioned that the first sort of sharding is this data, so data really shards. Can you explain in, so today, right, we have the existing Ethereum that we know, and, you know, it's very much a capacity and the transactions are too expensive and you know, it's a big pain for lots of, for the users. So when you have these data availability charts, like how will they help scale Ethereum? And, you know, what kind of parts that gets executed today on Ethereum will be moved there? Yeah, so um, that's basically going to be the rollups. So um, when you you already we already have several rollups active on Ethereum now. So for example, zk sync um, and others. And basically, right now the way they work is they um, they post. Um, so for example, zk rollup works by posting this uh, blob of data on the chain that says like here are all the transactions. Here's and then at the end, there's a proof that says, okay, this is the new state rule that comes out of it. So uh, with data availability shards, you ha only have to pu put this very last part on the execution chain. You only have to put the part that says, um, this is the proof and this is the new state root on the, on the actual execution chain. And everything else um, just uh, can just go on... Uh, on the data availability shards. So you basically save like a huge amount of gas that you don't need anymore to post this data. But actually today, I guess you don't have rollups taking up a, a big part of the block space, no? I haven't looked at the stats in detail, um, but I would suspect that um, at least, I mean, they're still very, very new, right? Like um, we, we haven't had rollups for a very long time, but um, I, yeah. I would suspect that they would very quickly uh, dominate the block space because essentially they allow you to do things paying about 100 times less gas. So why would you do tra a transaction and pay 100 times more if you can do it for 100 times less? And, and of course, since it's much cheaper, there will be a lot more transactions, right? I mean, it's a kind of an obvious like consequence from having some sort of demand curve for transactions. Um, so I would say uh, the natural economic equilibrium should be that almost everything happens inside rollups. Okay, so um, let's talk about the concept of, of a shard, right? So is a shard kind of like a second blockchain that runs in parallel with the first one? Or how do I, how do I imagine this? So I, I, will, I will answer this question uh, from the perspective of um, data sharding, which is kind of this goal that we're currently working towards. And um, there might be or there will likely be in the further future execution shards, which will actually also be also um, execute code. Um, but that is currently like that, that is several years in the future. And, um, and so I, I, I will not uh, take that mainly into account because data shards already achieve a lot of what we want to do. So from the perspective of the data shards that we're rolling out now, you shouldn't see the shards really as uh, as different uh, blockchains because they will not come they will not kind of come with their own fork choice rule and um, build on each other and so on. It's basically just uh, you could say um, it's just additional blobs of data that you put on the chain, but with a special property, and that property is that full nodes do not need to download these blobs in order to ensure um, that they are available. Like they, it, that we have a scalable solution that allows full nodes to know that they're available without downloading them. How does that work? So this, is, this comes from a very interesting um, technique um, that, that is called data availability sampling. Um, the essential idea is that um, you, you, can, you can sample you sample small amounts randomly selected from the data, and thus you know that very, very likely very large parts of the data are available. So this is obviously not enough, because when you, if you do that, 
then you notice that, oh, like, but 99.9% .9 of the data being available is not enough because that 0.1% could be exactly where an attacker hides their malicious transaction that prints 1 trillion Ether, for example. So we need 100%. And the way you do that is by encoding the data in a special way that makes sure that even if you only have 50% of it, you can always reconstruct 100%. And that is the key trick towards data availability that allows it to scale. And that means that basically with a very small constant amount, so it does not actually depend on the total amount of data that um, we ensure to be available of these samples, you can ensure that the full data is always available for download. If you look at Ethereum 1, you have miners and you will have validators after, after the merge. So how are the shards maintained? Are there also validators who maintain the shards? Yes. Um, so validators will be randomly selected, essentially. So there, there, are, there are committees. Um, a committee is, um, is a random selection from the full validator set. And these basically validate the shards. Um, they, they, they are kind of... I guess the right thing to say with data shards, they are this first barrier, this, this first group of people who like are responsible for sh checking that the full data is available. And they need to do nothing else because there's no execution, so they do not need to do anything except for knowing that the data is available because that's all the data shards do. And the validators, they are, but, but they only validate on the shards. They don't validate on the main chain. They do. No, no, no. It's the okay. same validator. So this is, it's only one set of validators. It's all the same. Ah, okay, okay. And they both, um, they both validate the beacon chain and they validate the shards. And, um, and this is, this is essential. Like, I mean, this is one of the, I mean, this is why, why sharding is so important in, in our terms. Like, um, it's this notion that we call shared security. So like the essential part is we don't want, I mean, you could ask the question, like, well, can't, can't, can't you just have like many different blockchains communicating with each other um, and uh, you get the same as shards? Problem is that you don't. You don't get shared security. Like each of these blockchains only has its own smaller validator set um, and so has much less value securing it. Whereas like in a sharded system, the essential thing is that it's always the full value that is securing the, the whole system. There's no like subset that is responsible for one shard. Okay, so basically, say I'm a validator now on, on the main chain, and I also then have to validate um, the shards. Do I have to validate all of them, or do I get a subset? Basically, you get randomly assigned every epoch to one of them. So basically, it's, you, you have like a, completely, a completely random one that you have to validate. So you don't have to validate all of them. You will be, on, you will be, will be validating all of them, but each epoch, you only, epoch, you only validate one of them. And that is random. So you're, you're basically, you're, you're only doing the work of validating one of them. Okay, so does this also mean that proof of stake is a prerequisite for, for sharding? So uh, the answer is yes. And the, the reason is that miners don't have any sort of identity. So um, you cannot, the, the notion of assigning like a miner to a random committee and telling them like you need to validate this shard now it doesn't make any sense because they don't have any the only thing that identifies them is how many how much hash power they have whereas um, validators and proof of stake they have to pay this deposit and after that they have a public key and we can say like this is the public key that is now in this committee so in that way it is essential to have proof of stake for sharding Okay, and are all um, data shards created equal or are there different flavors and how many of them will there be? So they, they, are, they are exactly equal. There's no difference between them. Um, the only way is how applications use them. So there could be rollups which basically decide I only accept blocks that are um, submitted on a certain shard number, which makes sense for them because then they need to check less data for whether it's relevant for them. Um, but uh, but from the from the consensus layer, um, they they are exactly equal. And how how can I make sure that my transaction gets sent to the right shard? So th this would this would only be relevant. Um, so I mean, this is an application uh, specific um, detail. 
but like uh, but the an the answer will depend on what kind of rollup um, you use and it's I would say it's very likely that in most applications a user will not usually at least directly send their transaction to a shard or like to the validators even and they will rather send it to um, whoever is responsible for creating blocks of this rollup and they will then put it on uh, on a shard so if i understand correctly the data shards are mainly targeted at rollups can i use this to store other kind of data so kind of say for instance oracle data that kind of clogs um, the blockchain currently yes i mean i don't see why it couldn't be used uh, for oracle Codes. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to think about basically you, the, the only thing is it, it would still be a kind of roll up Oracle, I guess. Like, so in, in a way, in a way, it's, it's all roll ups. Um, yeah, um, but, but, but I mean, you can, you can have many different kinds of roll ups. Like, you could have like a contract specific roll up. Like, I mean, actually, many roll ups right now are very application specific, right? For example, they only do transfers, which is in, in essence one application. Um, so I think the roll-up notion is not uh, is not restrictive. It can do everything. It's just it's just an, a way of implementing what you want to do. When you want to trade tokens on Ethereum, make sure to consider Paraswap. Paraswap is a decentralized exchange aggregator, so that you can get the best price across multiple Ethereum dexes. And now Paraswap has just been integrated in Ledger Life. This means you can swap tokens using your ledger directly from the Ledger Life app. No third parties involved. Paraswap is also multi-chain and available on Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. We'd like to thank Paraswap for their support of Epicenter. Maybe it would make sense to spend like a few minutes if you could explain a little bit like how do rollups work and what do you think the role of rollups is going to be in the future yeah rollups are essentially this notion that you use the chain only to ensure that data is available without itself computing the correct execution of the of the data so most obvious way this is when you uh, when you use so there are two flavors of rollups, right? There's there are optimistic rollups and zk rollups or zero knowledge rollups. So the way zk rollups do do this is maybe the more obvious one. Like you put all the transaction data on the chain, and then you have a zero knowledge proof that says this is the result of the execution of that, and here is the new state root. Now you could ask the question: Well, why do I even need to put the data on the chain if I know that the computation was done correctly, right? Why, why does that matter? And the reason for that is that you need to be able to reconstruct the state as well as just the root. Like if you just have the root, the problem is that the root is not enough to access your account. You always also need a proof that shows that your balance in that account is X, right? You need this as well. And you can only generate that if you have the state. So that's why it's essential for preserving this um, trustlessness that you that you also get all the data that's required to reconstruct the state. This can actually be less than all the transactions. So you can also in a zk rollups, for example, it, it can also just be a diff of the state. It can just be literally like the difference in the state that you need to put on chain. But that part is essential. An optimistic rollup does it slightly differently. It it puts all a list of all the transactions, and in this case, it has to be all the transactions, even including signatures, um, on the chain. And uh, also adds like the new state root says like this is the result of executing this. Um, and then anyone can if if there was an incorrect one, if there was some incorrect execution and this is not the correct outcome, then anyone can post a fraud proof that reverts this block and um, and resets the chain to the previous state. So that ensures that um, a fraudulent transaction can never be included in that rollup. To get some more background on uh, ZK Sync and ZK Rollups, last week's episode was with Alex Kowski of Matter Labs. So uh, you can also go back one episode and check that out. So, Dankrat, can I ask about this switch from full shards or execution shards, as you called them earlier, to data availability shards? Because if I recall correctly, 
a while ago, the idea was to actually have full execution charts that would um, not just make data available, but also be able to execute smart contracts and then um, loop back into the main chain. Wh why was this um, abandoned? Or at least, if not abandoned, then kind of split into two, into a journey of two parts. Right. Um, so um, to be actually clear here, I think doing these data shards first has always been on the roadmap, but was probably less emphasized. I guess uh, several years ago, it was thought that this is like just a first step to kind of test the whole system out and test it under load. And more and more, um, it has become clear, I would say, how awesome rollups are, like how, what, because they on their own already provide, provide this 100x scaling, essentially, if they do, if you do them well. So in the end, you could ask the question, like, why would you do, why would you even do, and like, even on the execution charts, why would you do anything other than rollups? Um, so this is, I would say, why it has more and more converged towards this notion of, well, actually, like, the main the main advantage, like the the huge scaling, comes when you have the rollups, and um, and and maybe execution in the end won't even be necessary. But a factor of a hundred, I mean, that's still not enough, right? I mean, basically, if you look at the adoption of Ethereum right now and the potential adoption of Ethereum, and if you if you then also look at what the um, what the gas prices yeah. currently are. It seems to me that a factor of 100, yeah, it's something, but it's not a lot. <laughs> oh, right. Absolutely. Oh, no, no. But I mean, uh, the, uh, the rollups can scale the current system as it is pre-sharding by 100x. Now, once we add sharding data shards, just data shards to that, then you get another like 100x of the data availability, roughly, like order of magnitude. So now we add 10,000x. So that, that, is, that is a serious amount of scaling to start with. And that is not an absolute limit. Like we can add further shards. Um, so the 64 shards is, um, is according to, that, that, is, that is just a constant. Um, of course, there are trade-offs and like um, it, it depends on how much value we have at stake and also importantly, how many users there are, how many shards we can support um, securely. But it can be scaled further from that point. So there's no that 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 100x is not the limit that we are at. Let's go back to the execution charts. So I now understand that uh, the data availability charts were always part of the plan. But what do you gain from execution charts that currently data availability charts cannot give to Ethereum? So I guess this depends. Um... So, so this this basically this depends on how far um, zero knowledge proof technology uh, will develop in the future. So I think the main downside there there are basically some downsides of optimistic rollups in terms of their finality. In ter well, I mean, yeah. So so basically they they need this very annoying um, two week withdrawal delay that you can kind of work around for small users like that don't have too much value um, but uh, but it's always gonna be a problem like the solution uh, is great for many things but it's not perfect so now if you if you have very good if we can get a very good uh, zero knowledge virtual machine basically a complete virtual machine that you can run inside um, a uh, zero knowledge proof um, within the next few years then theoretically you can already with that um, like build essentially what are execution charts um, from, uh, from what we have now. And then potentially at that point getting execution charts might just mean nothing more than enshrining that, um, that ZK rollup that is doing that. Um, so that might be like a very simple step if we, if we get there. Well, I mean, I'm I'm very interested to see the progress on this. Like the zero knowledge proof space has like made really amazing progress, and almost every year like delivered more than I would have expected. Um, so I would uh, I would not say it's impossible, but it is still a very very difficult thing to uh, to deliver the full uh, the full kind of everything that the EVM does now in a in a zk rollup. 
If we don't get that, then execution shards might basically special kinds of shards where you essentially get much faster finality because the difference to like the problem with the with the optimistic rollups is that you have these kind of finality delays. Um, and uh, and if we if we do make validators responsible again for checking execution, which is essentially what an execution chart would mean, then then you would basically get um, get this another settlement layer on on top. I would say. Oh, that's super interesting. I, actually, I would would love it if you can speculate a little bit on how do you think the sort of supply of Ethereum block space and throughput is going to develop you know, over the next year or so, and how much and when do you think those different technologies will start to have an impact? Right. I mean, I think my intuition is that we can see the impact of rollups right now. Like we have seen this huge crash in gas prices, essentially. And I think that is probably partially because a lot of people have actually moved uh, to rollups now for some simple applications, um, which is amazing. I, I don't think the gas reduction on the main chain is going to last, but the reduction on the rollup is going to last. Um, so, so that's pretty great. So there, there is basically right now, at least for simple things, there is already this um, pretty much 100x uh, increase in supply um, as long what, as what you'd want to do is uh, transfers of uh, ether, ether or ERC20. And then the next, the next very big thing from that will essentially be sharding. So when we activate the data shards, then um, for everyone who uses rollups, there will be another 100x increase in supply in block space. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school, and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets, and from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat, and they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. One of the problems that you also get with execution charts, if you were to introduce them, right, is cross shard communication and composability and the consequences of this on finality. Do you think this is this is such a hard problem that it's it won't be solved? Or do you think if if we need to, we can solve this? It's not so much that cross charts like cross chart communication is not an unsolvable problem. It is just a a difficult engineering problem to get all the details right at least for asynchronous communication for synchronous um then then yes you have you have a very difficult problem at hand not an unsolvable one again but i think that that yes that essentially my guess would be that's not going to happen um that you will do synchronous communications across shards or in the data shards world you you actually have the same problem it's basically cross roll up co uh, communication in this case Okay, can you just explain uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication in this context? Yes, so um, asynchronous is basically um, the, without, like, without a certain delivery guarantee. Like, you can't, you can't. So, so synchronous communication would be what enables uh, composability uh, directly between yeah. charts, um, which I think um, is is not. Is not a very realistic thing to expect um, in that in in this uh, sense because um, uh, because it would mean that anyone can lock up um, resources uh, on on the blockchain. Like I mean, essentially, what composability means is that you have this lock on the on the whole chain in a way, right? Where where only you get to determine what happens. 
And I don't feel like this is likely to be a thing across charts, um, although very theoretically possible. I mean, in computing, we have all the models to do that. Um, it doesn't make that much sense to me. There are all kinds of um, ideas to get around this, um, but I think the more realistic thing of how that will uh, work out um, is uh, that, that you have certain ecosystems in sh certain charts or certain rollups um, that care about composability internally. Um, but not, but are more loosely coupled um, to the other systems around them and are okay with asynchronous communication, which is um, you send a message and it will be delivered at some point, but you don't have any guarantee when, like any absolute guarantee. In practice, it will always be very, very fast, but you have to consider this very worst case that it could be delayed for a very long time. Okay, so let's talk about composability across data shards. So basically, if I have um, data within different rollups, are these still available after the fact or is that a problem? Can these be accessed by other applications at a lot later point in time? Yes. So that is basically the way we've designed it. It's instantly available to, to everyone. So there's no delay in, in communication between um, between the different data shards. There is a limit in, I, I don't think, I think it's theoretically possible to have some notion of composability between ZK rollups. Um, I don't know if that will be built. Um, it's pretty much impossible for optimistic rollups to do anything like that. However, I think maybe one notion we should uh, Uh, we should correct here that many people have. So one rollup doesn't necessarily have to be only on one shard. So you could have a rollup that basically takes up 10 shard blocks like every in every um, cycle, right? And, uh, and essentially that rollup internally can provide full composability. So it is not like we are limiting any sort of composability between the data shards as long as There's one rollup, and um, at least for ZK rollups, we, we can, in theory, build these big rollups. Um, it's a matter of optimizing everything enough that uh, provers can handle this and are not too crazy expensive. Um, but you could, you could have these huge rollups that provide internal composability, at least. Ah, cool. That's, that's super interesting um, to hear. And I think this kind of clears up most of our questions around sharding. So I'd, I'd kind of like to switch gears and move into um, the second topic for today, which is statelessness. So statelessness is another big issue that the Ethereum Foundation research team is working on. So can you explain what the Ethereum state is and how it's used? So the Ethereum state um, is essentially... It, it consists on, on everything that is uh, stored on the Ethereum blockchain. So it would be, for example, for you as a user, it would be you, the balances of your accounts. It would be the balances in ERC-20 tokens that you have, um, but also any other kind of uh, data that is necessary for, for example, a smart contract um, to know whether something is valid. Um, it's the code of the smart contracts um, and uh, all, all of these things, those are all part um, of the Ethereum state. And, um, and at the moment, every, every node in the Ethereum network has to store this because the only way to know um, from whether one block is valid is to have the state and execute the, the, all the transactions in that block and update that state and, and, and know that this was all done correctly. What's the current state of uh, Ethereum, so the size of the state? And is that in itself the problem? I, I don't have the very best uh, idea of the numbers here because they also depend on, on implementation details. It's somewhere in the tens of gigabytes as far as I'm aware. I've been quoted numbers between 10 and 100 gigabytes. I, I believe it really depends on what exactly, uh, how exactly you store it. And you can do that more or less optimized. It is a problem in the sense that already that um, makes it necessary because each block does a lot of state accesses, right? Like each block, um, e each single transaction already accesses like at the very least two accounts, like the sender and the receiver. 
Um, and, uh, and so you have these hundreds of transactions and potentially like thousands of state accesses in them. Um, and if you, if you know anything about um, disk IO, then like, you know, that for example, a normal hard disk, like can't really handle that. Like each access costs already like on the order of 10 or more milliseconds. So like that, that is a very long time to wait. And that is why right now, um, Ethereum nodes basically need SSDs. There's no way around that. So it is a problem right now. It is also a much bigger problem is that you can do a DOS attack against this and blow the state up relatively cheaply to an even much larger size. And so like a lot of our gas costs are have to be structured around this, uh, making this so expensive that it won't happen. So basically, the, the goal for statelessness is to kind of go to a version of Ethereum that doesn't have this humongous state, right? So how would that look like? Yes. So to be clear, the state will still be implicit and some people, and this is something to be uh, discussed further, um, some people will still store that full state. Um, the question of statelessness around who needs to store that state and um and so uh, one thing um, that, that you can do basically with statelessness uh, is to structure everything so that you can, uh, you can validate a block without needing the state. Like you can, like just, if I just send you that one block um, in isolation without anything else, you can just from that information decide whether it is a valid Ethereum block or not. You do not need any other context than that. Um, that is what statelessness does. So how does this work technically? Wouldn't I have to have like some sort of representation of the entire state for that to actually work? Um, so it works because uh, we have cryptographic uh, techniques that allow us um, to uh, commit um, to, uh, to states in very succinct forms. And like basically everyone knows about these. They're called uh, Merkle trees, uh, as is, for example, one of these. Um, that's, so basically it gives us this just 32 byte, um, what we call state root that, that is a commitment to the state in the sense that, um, you cannot find any other state that would, would allow you to compute this commitment. And, uh, and what statelessness does is it, it gives you all the data that has been read by the transaction, including so-called witnesses. And the witness is a proof that this is the correct data given the state root. And you have the state root, like you know that because it's only very short, so you can just have that. So that's the only thing you need to store as the current state. Um, and the witness tells you, yes, this, this, is the, this is the correct data given that state root. Okay, I see. You, you said earlier that some people or some uh, validators still have to have the entire state. Why is that? Well, I mean, this is a design choice and um, there are different uh, potential designs here, but the design that we are aiming for now um, is, uh, is what we call weak statelessness. And weak statelessness means that you do need the state in order to produce blocks, but you don't need it in order to validate blocks. And that is a very good trade-off in our opinion, because um, it's okay to limit somewhat more the number of people who are able to produce blocks and that that is in practice, unfortunately, in some ways going to happen anyway because of the whole MEV thing. But as long as you have the, the ability to very easily verify it by everyone, that is okay. That, that, has, that has some very nice uh, implication in terms of um, the design space. Like it means that um, as a user, for example, you don't, like if you don't have this weak statelessness, if you want like strong statelessness in, in quotation marks, then, then what you would need is that every user always keeps the witnesses for their accounts around. Uh, and I don't think that is a very practical design. I think like from the UX point of view, the, the weak list statelessness is really like a, a sweet spot um, that is a very like kind of nice spot to live in. Okay, so this would then not reduce the size of the state, but basically it would reduce the number of people we require to actually keep that state. That's uh, correct. An another idea that's been thrown around is state rent, right? So basically, so you don't actually pay to store some sort of data on the blockchain once when you, when you 
send it in your transaction, um, but you actually pay continuously until uh, until you need it no longer stored or your money runs out and it gets deleted automatically. Where's that at? Do you think that's going to happen? Do these ideas work together or is this something else entirely? We we had these discussions around state rent um, and um, in a way, so statelessness um, alleviates this problem a lot because suddenly instead of like, I mean, we, we want a very large number of full nodes, right? In the ideal um, world, um, everyone who um, who works in any way with the Ethereum blockchain would run their own full node. Uh, for several reasons, that's not really completely realistic now, but this is the future that we are working towards that in some notion that this is possible. Um, and uh, and therefore, like statelessness really like reduces this problem of like having the state a lot because from like tens or hundreds of thousands of parties or millions who need to have all the state around all the time on their own SSD, um, you suddenly reduce it to like, say, hundreds of parties who are actually producing blocks on Ethereum, who have very large incentives anyway to keep the state around. Um, I mean, they yeah, they they will need it to produce the blocks. So uh, it alleviates this problem a lot. Um, it is a debate, I would say, whether that whether with that um, state rent is still necessary. Um, I would say if it comes, it will come in a ve in a slightly different form from what people consider state rent now. So it won't really be um, a notion of you continuously pay in order to have your state alive. It's more that um, your state will be will be will after some period, say one year, if you didn't do anything with it, it will become part of of a kind of old state where it can be reactivated at any time for like maybe paying slightly more gas. It's not you, you, you can't work with it anymore. So basically there's, there's no continuous payment. There's just like uh, probably this is at least the most likely ver version of state rent that I see it would be that if you don't use your state for a very long time, you will pay slightly more because you have to pay for a slightly larger witness. Okay, so I see how the size of the Ethereum state is a problem for some users and that it requires SSDs and so on. Um, but in some sense, an even larger problem with Ethereum is the fact that the EVM doesn't allow for parallelization of computation, right? So basically you have to do everything in a certain um, order um, and always look at the entire state, whereas some other blockchains have taken a more advanced approach. I mean, they were also later to the party. So basically for them, it was easy to see what the problems are. So I'm, I'm not taking sides here. But um, how do you feel about this inherent inability of the EVM to allow for parallelization? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a good point. Um, and that, this, that that's very uh, interesting. I honestly, I'm not an EVM engineer, so I cannot say in detail if there, if it's impossible to change this. Um, I can, I, I think like one large part of that is actually related in some way to statelessness in that one, one thing you would need in order to parallelize things is to know what state each transaction accesses, right? And in a way, we are starting to do that. Now, I don't want to say we have a complete way um, to parallelize things, but yeah, I mean, I, I can see that that is that is definitely like a, a very very important part, and that that would allow um, for a certain amount uh, of scaling if if you if you if you parallelize things. And I would say like um, it's a, it's certainly a very good decision to de to design around that. Um, and I would encourage people who design rollups to to do exactly that, to think about that as well, and. Uh, and maximize uh, the parallelism they can get out um, in order to be faster. Well, let's zoom out a little bit and talk a bit about, you know, Ethereum and where this project is going. Like, what makes you excited and what do you think is the impact that Ethereum will have on the world? Wow, I think like uh, <laughs> that, that is, it's still, I mean, it's very, very hard in our time 
to make uh, predictions about things further than five to 10 years out, I would say, um, because there's just too many things that are on, on exponential I, trajectories. I, I'll settle for five to 10 years out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, Ethereum uh, can provide many, many different things uh, for different users. Um, it's essentially this uh, coordination layer that allows you uh, to make certain certain parts. Of course, it doesn't replace a community in any way, right? Like it's it's only a technical layer, but it allows you to solve some of the problems of uh, getting communities aligned on certain goals and turning things into positive sum games. I think that is the amazing thing that this technology allows. And we have seen that around um, this resurgence now after, I guess, the initial shock um, of DAOs, like where many, many people have started creating DAOs. And um, and um, they, they seem to work in some ways, at least for now, which is great. Like, this is amazing. Communities have found together and have found a way to coordinate around certain goals without having to go th through the traditional way of doing this via a corporation, for example, which would have been the old way, which has like other costs associated with it, essentially. You said that um, it turns things into positive sum games. So let me ask you for the metric. So basically, what's the metric that you think is going to improve for the average Joe using blockchain technology? I mean, the average Joe right now doesn't use blockchain technology, right? Um, basically, nobody does that. Um, and uh, I think the, the question can be on many, many different levels. And I think we're already seeing it, surprisingly. Like, it, it essentially, it changes the game of finance at the moment, mainly, because financial applications are what comes first, just because they have, just have the most money, the most willingness to pay. Um, but, uh, but this permissionless ecosystem that allows anyone to just go there and create, like, create something and deploy it, without having to ask anyone for permission, allows people to just play with it a lot. And I think we are right now, we are already seeing the effect of that in terms of all the, the fintechs. Like, I mean, my, my online banking apps have improved like tons over the last years. And I think this is obviously not based on blockchain technology, but it's based on the pressure that these companies now see where the comp competition will come from. Like, you don't have to be a blockchain user in order to see the improvement. It will come to you anyway, because the others have to keep up. Otherwise, we're coming for them. So you mentioned uh, finance as this kind of first area that's getting a lot of traction. And then you also talked about how, you know, on a high level, you see Ethereum or blockchains as this like coordination layer that allows, you know, allows people to accomplish things more efficiently together. To what extent do you also think that blockchains will kind of financialize a lot of things around coordination that are today don't rely on financial incentives directly? Oh, this is a difficult uh, question. I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean. Like, do you mean your local sports club is going to become a DAO and uh, suddenly everyone has a token or something. I, I'm not sure what that question refers to. Well, I guess that sort of ties into like, I think Gnosis especially has done like some work around ideas like this too, right? Where you use like prediction markets to have, uh, make decisions as organizations. And um, I, I, th I think, I mean, I, I, I can see this fear, but I think like mainly it provides new options. I don't, I don't think... Nobody is going to force you to use a financialized prediction market. It is still like it is still your choice. So I don't see why why it would it would become like a forcing function for average people to just uh, financialize everything. Um, you can, um, but this is your choice. And I think like um, many many blockchains will will provide things that are not financial in nature. Like um, systems can be built on top of them. Who says we can't now already, for example, build um, a Twitter, um, a decentralized Twitter, for example. I think that would absolutely be possible. Um, people are already be building decentralized messaging apps um, that doesn't have to be, f be financialized. So I don't, I don't see that automatically everything has to be financialized. So, so you think uh, the fact that open finance has moved in first um, is just because of ideological proximity or, you know, being 
tech adjacent and uh, the more social apps are going to come at a later point in time, but they'll come? I think right now, I think it's just that the um, the more social, for example, apps, uh, as you call them, uh, are just priced out of it. Um, and that is a natural consequence of uh, finance just always like being there and and being just a very valuable application. Like, let's be honest about it. Finance is a very valuable application, um, but it means that it prices out a lot of things, which is kind of a shame from the development perspective because obviously we are losing kind of important time where these other systems uh, could bootstrap themselves and could start providing valuable things um, but uh, but I mean we are now building the rails that will allow this in my opinion I think like when we have sharding uh, when we have this um, people will build uh, all these other systems on them and they, they will come I think And I think I think I'll end on a divisive question here. Um, do you think um, the applications that will need less economic security because they will not be securing the values that financial applications inherently do will actually need Ethereum as a base layer? I mean, could they could, could they run on any number of other um, protocols that don't have the economic guarantees that Ethereum currently has? I think we're there are different questions here and i mean i i would say probably yes if you if you expect that the decentralized twitter will just put its data on the shards i don't expect that that will be the case i think what it will do what many applications might do um, is use uh, some blockchain and maybe ethereum because it is the settlement layer but who knows whether that is necessarily the case in the future um, we'll use this For example, any of these applications, they can, right now, let's talk about Tor, for example, which is concrete decentralized applications that's out there now. But it has huge problems getting people to actually run nodes, right? We, we do need some sort of payment for this. Like we do need some way of getting people to like run the infrastructure and so on. And I think that is more important. Like that, that, that is where blockchains like Ethereum come in. Probably not for the data itself. You don't. You don't need. To. But but it could be for some sort of commitment to the data that makes a lot of sense. Um, but not for the data itself. I would I would predict in the long run. But the economic incentive layer, surely the the economic securities that should require depend on how large the incentives are, right? So basically, if the incentives um, are minuscule compared to the um, security that Ethereum affords you, then using Ethereum as a base layer may be overkill, right? I, I expect that um, Ethereum with rollups and charts will be, will be quite cheap. So um, I, I do not think that you expect uh, to pay... Well, I... I, I I would say it's in the cent or sub cent range what you would expect for normal transactions in in that future in Ethereum, and I think a, a lot of applications will be able to pay that. I think this is actually a super nice closing statement. So sub cent transaction fees, you heard it here first. Dankrat, thank you so much for coming on. It was uh, pretty technical, but I think there was a lot there. So if people want to dig into this. Um, some more. Where should where where can they go and find more information on these topics? The, this depends obviously on the technical level um, that uh, they want to get into. Um, there are a lot of people trying to write blog posts about um, about these things. I I can certainly collect some resources and uh, and we can add them to the description of the podcast. Honestly, we could do better in that respect. I don't think we're like we're. Uh, And I would encourage if anyone wants to come forward and is good at, at digesting the information, writing it up, we, we need more of that. It's way too little in the whole space. And I know many people have trouble catching up. If you really want to get into the tech, then I think ETH Research, the forum, is an amazing like a resource that has a lot of stuff. And it's usually not super difficult to understand. People try to make it somewhat understandable. But the main problem is just a huge amount of information to digest that most people probably can't completely catch up with. Okay, we'll, we'll link to these. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.